Hey everyone, it's Keon. Before the story begins, I'd like to share a service that you might find really useful if you were a very busy person like me, or if you just really like convenience. I do want to say that this is not sponsored by Factor at all. Uh, as some of you might know, I have three jobs. I work full-time at Walmart, I also work part-time at a high school, and of course I manage and create content for this channel. As you can imagine, this leaves very little time for my other personal tasks, especially cooking. I've been using Factor for several months now to free up my personal time. So Factor essentially is a meal prep delivery service, which means they bring cooked meals to your home every week. But you don't have to do it every week, personally. Um, I do it once a month. You can skip weeks. Um, I freeze the other meals, then take some out for the next week. And there's actually a lot of meals to choose from. And I love that you can select meals based on your diet. So if you want to check them out, the link is in the description. I believe it's up to 60% off your first order. So that's really an awesome deal. You even get discounts up to your fourth order. With that out of the way, enjoy tonight's story, everyone. And remember, stay cosmic. Chapter 1 The room was filled with the sound of tapping feet, battering lashes, awkward cuffs, and the reverberation of shivering torsos as we all did our best to avoid being caught in the crosshairs of an ill-timed gaze. Most of us simply stared off into the distance, redirecting our sight to the vapor-covered windows that made the walls of the building. The avoidance of gazes across the oval conference table went on for an unbelievable amount of time, just as much time as it took to disengage from accidentally locking eyes with someone else. It had just been 30 minutes, but somehow felt longer. To cope, some began twirling objects between their fingers, a pen, a penny, a pencil, anything to occupy them while they waited. This seemed to cure the issue of jumpiness, but it didn't last. One person's coping mechanism began to make another antsy. It was entropy at its finest. Locked in this edging stalemate of anxiety and awkwardness, it didn't take long before someone stood from the other side of the oval glass table and asked what everyone was thinking. Where the f- I mean, where's Edward? He should have gotten here by now. There was no answer to the question, not immediately at least, as the question was on everyone's mind something that couldn't be said for the answer. After a few minutes, some seconds really, Edward's assistant stood from her chair and apologized for Edward's lateness. She explained that he hadn't answered several of her calls, and the one he did answer sounded mumbled and odd, something she explained away as poor reception on his end. After she had given a reason for Edward's absence, or at least a reason for not knowing the reason behind his absence, she asked for more time as he was sure to arrive before the additional wait time elapsed. There wasn't much choice. Everyone waited for another 25 minutes. It would have been nice to say Edward had shown up before the time elapsed, but he didn't. She stood up after the 25th minute and it was clear to see that she was about to ask for more time, but the words hadn't made it out from her lips before the collective stare of people locked in the conference room for almost an hour led her to do something else. The meeting for the upcoming project was postponed because of Edward's absence. He was the project director, and the body couldn't walk without its head for long, and as such, having the meeting without him would have amounted to talking to the wind. There was a loud grumbling of mutual annoyance, heightened by a hiss or two from the room's extreme after the end of the meeting was called. The scorn was earned. My annoyance at the postponement didn't trump my anger at the time wasted waiting in the conference room. There was nothing I hated more than meetings that could have been emails. These were the sort of commodities Edward peddled in. He was a meeting guy. That is why, as annoying as it was, it was also weird that he hadn't been in attendance. Edward wasn't one to miss meetings or even workdays at all. He was always the first one in the building and the last one out. At least, I think he was the last one. I never stayed in the building long enough to find out. Maybe he was sick? I thought. But I could have sworn he never took sick days either. The thought didn't stay on my mind for long as I began packing my stuff to make it out of the conference room. 
There were slight whisperings between some in the room, no doubt, talking about the same thing I was thinking of with a grim expression on their face. I was about to stand when a loud hum pinned me to the chair. Are you alright, Ethan? Someone asked. You look as if you're about to pass a stone. My words felt heavy, so I gestured yes with my hands and remained on the chair. The hum intensified and trailed off as soon as it began. Everyone had trailed out of the conference room by the time I came to. With a slight push and pull, I slipped from behind a chair and made it outside the conference room. Walking back to my cubicle, just after stepping out of the door, I noticed the office's emptiness. Did everyone decide not to come to work today? Or was it a holiday? Had I lost track of time again? The parting of the slide doors that followed the ding saw me step out of the elevator and onto the fifth floor, where my office, cubicle, was located. A few seconds after getting to the cubicle, I brought out a pen and continued twirling it from where I stopped in the conference room. My annoyance at Edward's absence had turned into curiosity. There were a few things that were sure. Death, taxes, and Edward coming to work under any circumstance. I mean... The man came to work while his wife was in labor. Was he dead? Why are you thinking about this? I asked myself. He probably got wrapped in something more important. And what was that sound in the conference room? I stopped twirling and put the pen at work doodling and scribbling concepts for the next meeting, whenever it was. I was still sketching designs when I heard footsteps headed towards me. It was John. What did he want now, I thought. Hey, Ethan! Hey man, want to grab a drink after work? Would have loved to, but I already planned something with my girlfriend. Fancy restaurant and all that, (laughs) I said. Okay, he said before leaning into the edge of the cubicle, a sure sign he wasn't about to start leaving. Is it just me or has it been colder these past few weeks? I almost dismissed the notion but caught myself before I did. Perhaps some are just taking a bit of time to kick in even though it already did. Do you think it has anything to do with the disappearance people are talking about online? Uh, what missing people? I asked, prompting John to pull out his phone from his pocket. After a tap, he handed me the rectangular brick with a smug look on his face that I imagine a reporter who was the first to stumble on a piece of information would have. I flipped through the headlines talking about missing people. They all read like conspiracies. So I handed John back his phone and made a mental reminder to text my girlfriend when John left. Hey, are you alright? Your eyes almost gazed over, John said. Did you hear that? I asked as I held my head. Well, it was just a hum the first time. It almost sounded as if someone had been trashing about very loudly this time. Hear what? I waved a question. It was probably just a migraine, I reasoned. Wait, aren't you supposed to be at the meeting? John asked, interrupting my thoughts again. I intimated him with the account of the meeting before going back to the paper. It's unlike Edward not to come to work, John said before leaving. At least, I think he left. I hadn't actually seen him leave. Edward's absence meant we could go home early, so I did. I took my one-handed bag, filled it with my laptop and notepads, crossed it over my body and started for the elevator. That's when I saw it. Folded between the clouds for a second, I looked harder into the cloud, but there was nothing there. (sighs) Ha! Great! I was seeing things that weren't there now. I couldn't afford to drink the Kool-Aid or whatever John was handing out. Purging my mind of the thoughts wasn't easy, but I did, mostly just replacing them with something else as I entered the elevator. Why was it so cold? It was July, and I could have sworn I saw a snowflake back there. It had no business being this cold. I thought as my mind harkened back to the shivering torsos. I walked out of the elevator in the building. I was almost clear of it when someone grabbed me violently and began yanking at it. One swift turn brought me to face the culprit. Almost an inch from punching, I stopped to look at the disheveled man with torn clothes, unkempt hair, and a miasma rivaling smell. It was Edward. Chapter 2 Despite being in it, 
to ride over here had flown past me as the thoughts in my mind looped back to Edward's unexplainable transformation. No matter how much my mind prodded the situation for any discernible resolution, it came up blank. The lack of an answer created a loop that caused me to descend more levels for reasons that refused to present themselves, if they existed at all, that is. It had taken Leslie calling me a couple of times for me to step out when the cab arrived. Even now, I remember, her voice brought me back and pulled me out of spiraling further into the rabbit hole. Ethan? Ethan? Yes. Yes? Where were you just now? What? I asked, not sure what was happening. Leslie looked at me with an inclined head to measure my attention against an unseen metric. She suggested calling the entire thing off if I wasn't ready. I'm sorry. I was thinking of something, I said before sitting up. We were seated in the Sea Pearl, a restaurant in the outer part of the city, just by the water. Catching a break from going down the rabbit hole, I allowed myself to take in the outdoor restaurant. It had set pieces as breathtaking as its surrounding. So enough of living in your head. I think it's time to order, don't you? Leslie asked. Yeah, yeah, of course. I said as I signaled our readiness to order from the sole waiter on the floor. She stopped a few inches from our table, wearing a big smile and a golden bracelet with a heart in the middle to match. What will you be ordering today? It took less than a minute to order. After ordering, we began to chat as we waited for the food to come. The waiter had promised us a 15-minute window before our dish arrived. Leslie and I had been trying to get into the Sea Pearl for years. Fifteen minutes was a small price to pay. Leslie decided that we could use the time to catch each other up on our day. I agreed and prompted her to go first as I wasn't quite certain about what really happened during mine. All right, she started, telling me about a strange earthquake she had read about online. Apparently, the tremor had come out from nowhere without the usual telltale signs. Huh. As strange, I remarked as my mind began mulling over possible collations with the cold. It was, Leslie said before telling me about the rest of the day. Her co-workers were still a pain to work with and the job hadn't gotten less hectic. Nothing out of the ordinary, she summed up before passing the question to me. I took a huge breath before explaining how my day had started annoyingly and became stranger as the clock counted down. I broached the topic, bumping into Edward just outside the lobby. What do you think happened to him? Leslie asked. I thought about it for the upteenth time that day, and still couldn't come up with a reason. The only answer I could attempt was that he must have fallen in with the wrong crowd, or probably got wasted the previous day at a party or something. I didn't stay behind after I handed him over to the building security. Leslie also found the experience odd, but what was odder was that Edward kept repeating the phrase, They are coming. They are here. I asked several times what he meant, but he didn't seem to have the answer, or, if he did, wasn't inclined to share. Leslie's eyes were filled with a curiosity that mirrored mine. Did it have anything to do with what John said? Although I tried not to, I couldn't help but ask if she had heard cases of disappearances on the news. She replied that she had, before moving on to ask if I believed it, as if every disappearance case felt like something out of a prankster's mind. Should we leave? She asked. The answer to her question was interrupted by the hum again. I was getting tired of the unnecessary outbreaks. After weathering the humming, I moved to answer her question. We couldn't leave. We'd been trying to get a reservation at this restaurant for a long time to let a few unverified claims cause us to lose the reservation. Leslie pointed out the relative emptiness of the restaurant and encountered that restaurants like this one often kept themselves exclusive by giving the illusion of desire even if it cost them sales. It's probably our lucky day, I suggested. Talking about fine dining, I wondered why our orders weren't here yet. It was already 25 minutes. Was everyone intentionally keeping me waiting? There was probably some god out there playing a prank on me. Hi, excuse me. I called the waiter and queried the status of our order. She was shocked to see we hadn't gotten what we had ordered. 
I'm going to check on the chef. She replied and stepped out of sight. There was a slight scream after she went in. What was that? I asked no one in particular as I turned around to check if anyone was bothered about the scream that rang out from inside. When no one did anything about the scream, I stood from the chair and started for the kitchen when Leslie held me by the hand. Where are you going? She asked. I told her I meant to check the kitchen, and she answered by demanding that we leave. Something felt off about all of this. I mean, come on, we haven't paid. We can just leave now, get a cheap bottle of wine, and drink ourselves to sleep. After I think about it, I refused. I promised you a good time, and that is what I'm going to provide. A good time. Don't you want that, babe? We should have gone home, but flattered by the admiration I saw behind Leslie's words and the urge to find out what the hum was, I matched uneven as the unbothered patrons remained unbothered. Something horrible hit my nose as I got closer to the kitchen, but I paid no heed. With the sole goal of eating in the restaurant, I continued, only stopping to look through the embedded circular glass in the swinging red door. It didn't provide much insight into what was happening as it was covered with thick steam. Probably from the cooking, I thought as I pushed the door and stepped into the kitchen. It took a while for my eyes to get used to the fluctuating lights. But when I did, that's when I saw it. There was red plastered all over the wall. I felt my stomach churn even as my legs threatened to give up. There was no chef. No waiters. Just red everywhere. And an amputated hand, wearing a golden bracelet with the heart in the middle, hanging from the ceiling. I took two breaths to quiet the rambling thoughts in my head. It wasn't totally silent, but I dragged myself out of the kitchen, grabbed Leslie's hand, and pulled her along with me. We need to leave. I said to her. Leslie tried to find out what I had seen, but there was no time to explain. Now! I shouted as I pushed through the crowd of confused patrons to get to the entrance. We stopped the cab and urged him to begin driving before he could even register where we were going. What the fuck is happening, Ethan? I don't know. I answered. We weren't far from the restaurant when I began hearing the wails of people from behind. Chapter 3 I woke up with a deafening ring in both ears that got louder as the seconds trickled by. A constant reminder that I was no longer unconscious and everything that came before hadn't been a dream. With the ringing still blaring from both ears, trying to move was an uphill battle, even more so since I was hanging upside down, held only by the seatbelt. Leslie convinced me to wear it at the last moment. I could feel something rushing to the top of my head. Blood. I couldn't tell if it was internal or not. It took me almost an eternity to undo the seatbelt, causing my body to dash into the shards of glass strewn about. It didn't take long before I felt the wetness from my torso and leg. I stayed there for a while as pain radiated throughout my body. To distract from it, I turned my neck as far as I could, only to see the cab driver whose head was bent into a position not compatible with living. That was when it hit me. Leslie. She was beside me when the sudden earthquake threw everything on its head. Where was she? I tried shouting her name, but the fall knocked the wind out of me. I only began to move minutes after. Slowly, I flipped myself onto my stomach and crawled through the window, cutting myself further as I dragged my body along the ragged remains of the door window. Using the flip cab as a support, I pushed myself to my feet and looked around for any sign of Leslie. Everywhere I looked was characterized by one word. Chaos. The entire street was filled with toppled cars, crumbling structures, and groans of pain that inspired confusion and panic. How long was I out for? Midway into surveying the area, I noticed something queer. I checked my phone to be certain and I was right. The time was 9 p.m. The sky was meant to be a dark canvas filled with dotting lights. But somehow, the night was as bright as day. I stumbled backward to the ground after looking up. There was a streak of fire running across the sky. What the fuck was happening? I thought to myself even as Edward's words rang through my mind. 
Finding my bearing was difficult, taking several tries to get on my knees. Barely able to stand on my feet, I decided to trace the trail of blood originating from the camp. Following the trail led me to a clearing free from the chaotic blend of tumbled cars and crumbling buildings. It still held the groan and murmur of pain and confusion. In front of me was a blindfolded crowd tied to the ground. My resolve to keep my distance melted away when I spotted her amongst the captured people. I looked everywhere for a sign of the capturers, and when I found none, I rushed in as fast as possible, as fast as I could with an injured leg. I rushed to Leslie, removed the blindfold, and urged her to remain calm as I tried to undo her restraints. I had first thought it to be a rope, but it wasn't. There was a lot of noise, but I could still hear each heartbeat as I continued my futile attempt to free her from her restraint. I was still trying to undo the restraints when Leslie spoke up. You need to leave here, Ethan. Please, before they find you. I looked up and saw tears rushing down her cheeks. Who did this to you? Maybe I could talk to them. Give them something in exchange for your freedom. They must want something. You can't give them anything. I was about to say something else when Leslie spoke up. Ethan, you need to leave now. Now. They're coming. I wasn't going to leave Leslie. I'd come this far and wouldn't leave without her. I turned around to face these cruel humans down. They'd have to kill me if they wanted to take Leslie. I was still waiting when I heard the inset of the horn. It began slowly until it grew loud enough to be mistaken for thunder in the sky. Still reeling from the horn orchestra in my head, I turned my head around when someone walked into the clearing. I had difficulty concentrating through the sounds in my head and the sight of the person in front of me. It was no human. It stood above seven feet, with two inclined slits, trailing a bony structure on its face's sides. I recognized that smell before. It was when I bumped into Edward. I was still wondering what I was looking at when Leslie shouted from behind and told me to run. If they catch you, they will kill you! It was difficult leaving Leslie. I was going to stand my ground before she accused me of being stupid for not running before they caught me. I promised I would return before running into the building closest to the clearing as cuts and bruises prevented me from going further. I limped into the building as the now shadowed figures followed from behind. I made it further into the building before catching a glimpse at the elevator across the hall. I couldn't be certain there was any power, but it was the fastest way away from these creatures on my trail, so I took a chance. The door was easier to pry open than expected. I stepped into it and repeatedly tapped the button for the highest level, even as the strange creatures closed the gap between us. I was beginning to fear that this was the end, when the elevator began its ascent. I leaned against the guardrail to catch my breath, as I couldn't imagine going further at my current pace. I was still urging the hum in my head away when the elevator stopped abruptly, and the lights went out. Had the power gone out? I wasn't through with the thought, when the blade came slicing through the elevator door as if it was paper. The blade cut through the door, the control panel, and some of the largest wirings I had seen on an elevator. In front of me was one of the things. It was hard to tell if it was an alien or something else. Not that I had much time to think about it, as it grabbed me and banged against the wall several times till my legs gave out. It raised me with a fraction of a speed and effort. It was about to stab me when I pushed into the wires behind it, causing wild sparks to fly. Enough time to run, so I did. Away from the elevator, I moved to another room as fast as compared to the heavy footsteps behind me. The hum had died off, but all the questions I couldn't ask stood in its place. It was getting colder. I could see my breath now. I hid behind a wall, with my hand placed over my leg, only for me to look behind to see a trail of blood. Shit, I thought. This was a line leading them straight to me. I cut out my shirt, tied it around my leg, propped myself up and continued going. I could hear the footsteps everywhere now. How many of them were inside the building? It had taken luck to beat one of them. I was not sure I could face another and come out alive. Although uncertain how it would help, I picked up a rod from the ground and continued up the stairs. Halfway through the stairs, I heard the sound from the top. 
causing me to run down an aisle of cold and darkness. The footsteps got close with every passing second. I threw my right hand over my mouth to stop anything from getting out. I would have liked to say it helped, but it didn't. I moved away from the spot when I began to hear sounds that sounded like words without any meaning. Peeking from my cover, I saw it was headed for me. It was now or never. I charged at it with the intent of putting the rod into it. It was only up close when I then realized how foolhardy my original plan was. The rod broke on impact, and as it came closer, I realized it was the same one from the elevator. I ran, but it got me, and was about to launch the blade into me when the hum began. I could feel the threads holding my brain, threatening to fall apart. It looked at me with its eyes, grabbed me and jumped out from the window, and dropped me at the clearing I started from. The crowd was still there, but with one major difference, chained up together, and they were floating now. Not only could I hear the screams, and I could feel the pain too, as my feet were no longer on the ground and were now in the air. An enormous force pressed into me from all angles. I was convinced I was going to pop when I fell flat on my face. I turned on my back, looked up at the sky, and saw that every crevice of darkness was gone, and the streak of fire had multiplied, forming various streaks of parallel fires revolving around the sky. In the middle of it was a big, floating geometrical shape. I watched as the streaks broke the revolving pattern and flowed to the ship. The hum died out, and everything went dark. Although most of my body was numb, I could feel myself being dragged through the asphalt. The grip holding the helm of my cloth was tight, and my weak attempt at undoing it was met with futility. How was I going to meet my end? Would it be quick? Or would my body be splattered everywhere? My thoughts were cut short as I slipped into unconsciousness. The world, the entire universe, swirled around me until it became even faster with each revolution. That's when I saw Leslie's face. She was calling out to me. And for a moment, it was real. As real as anything could be at that point but it didn't last as something bumped over my head. I woke with a start even as I surveyed the surrounding around me. It wasn't one I recognized. How long had I been out? And where was I? I was still mulling the questions when I became aware of two things. First was the man looking at me and the cold that covered everywhere. It took me a while before I realized who it was. Edward. I had a million questions. The first of them was, where was Leslie? And did she make it? You don't remember what happened? He asked. I thought about it for a second before the memory came flashing back in my mind. My stomach churned, but I couldn't throw up as I hadn't eaten anything in what was probably a while. Setting up too quickly had caused me to experience a spell of vertigo, but after it had passed, I asked Edward to show me the path they went in so I could rescue her. I still remember the look on his face when he looked up and told me that I wouldn't be able to do anything now. I stumbled back upon receiving the news, still hellbent on going. He pulled me back and pointed at the innards of what I would later come to know was a bunker. The world, as you know, has ended, he said. He explained to me that the things that attacked Earth were the creators of our star. It was an outstation. A power source to use whenever they get stuck in their travels. They were Prometheus, reclaiming the fire they gifted us. Humans, Edward claimed, were just a byproduct of the decision. To enable them to take up all that energy, they needed a particular element found in us to get the process going. They took it all and left, he said. Edward had to explain it several times before I understood it. The cold the destruction, the end. I was never going to see the sun again. I was never going to see Leslie, nor anyone else I love. Hey, sci-fi horror fans, it's Keon. Thanks for listening tonight. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below. 
Also, if you'd like to officially support the Dark Cosmos, you can do so by clicking the Join button. Membership starts at $5 only. And remember, stay cosmic.